Robin Vincent and welcome to Molten Modular. Today we're looking at the Erica Synths Black Sequencer. It's a delicious four channel CV and MIDI sequencer capable of 64 steps of 16 banks of 16 patterns with 16 songs. I think it can run your whole rig. It's got CV and gate out per track and also a very interesting and versatile and full of fun modulation output. You have some of the most deliciously turnable knobs I've ever had my fingers on. A smattering of well laid out patch points and a bunch of buttons down here. It has this wonderfully bright little screen in which all of its secrets are revealed and yet none of it is hidden away. You're not having to dig. There's a couple of button you know button gymnastics that goes on but that's only very occasional but otherwise everything is on the surface and my golly these these knobs man I mean they're encoders really because they go on forever and you can hear the clickiness the clickiness is fabulous I've never felt anything quite so robust and pleasing and lovely in all my life you just have to play now the Black Sequencer has been out a couple of months and I've kind of held back on doing my review because I wanted to really get to know it as best I could. And also there'd been sort of a steady stream of firmware updates coming out of Erica since. And there's a whole bunch of features that weren't in the original release which are here now. In particular, the ability to record into it. So in this review, hopefully I can demonstrate the main fruity features of the Black Sequencer. I mean, we know what a sequencer does. We're not idiots but hopefully I can show you a bit of the workflow uh, how it all comes together how easy and pleasing it is to play with and also some of the really cool features that have come about in the latest firmware updates so while the village around me is intent on creating as much noise from every place and every possibility I'm going to get stuck in going to have a bit of a play see where it takes us right just a quick look at the layout then you've got the knobs obviously over here they are encoders they're not potentiometers so they spin all the way around and as you can see they affect the display here or whatever parameter you happen to be on yeah easy over here you've got all your inputs and outputs you've got four channels cv and gate one two three and four with their corresponding modulation outputs which are really really interesting got some inputs here cv gate mod in then we've got clocks resets and midi in and out it does do midi it does four channels of midi it's not a polyphonic midi sequencer like some of the other hardware sequencers are it sort of mirrors whatever the cv and gate are doing so if you can do four channels of cv gate you can send out four channels of midi the same notes the same note on off information you can set some velocity but other than that it's just mirroring essentially whatever the analog side is doing but you can run the two simultaneously so you could double up on midi and analog modular stuff if you so wished then you have the four channel buttons here. You select the channel that you want to be working on. And then you've got the buttons which do stuff. CV, gate, ratchet, shuffle, modulation. And then shift to those. You've got glide, probability, repeating, timing and up. You've got direction range, mute and solo, scale and quantization, copy, paste, clear, patterns and banks, songs, setups, bars, transport it's all there it's all laid out very easily accessible so let's start afresh if you want to make a tune plug your voltage octave into cv1 stick your gate into gate one stick some modulation into mod one so i've got cv going to an honor oscillator I've got gate going to an envelope generator over here, which is pumping away at the veils here to produce the envelope to the sound. And I've got modulation going to the filter that it's going through. Hit play and you're off. It's, it's fascinating. I know, really, really good. The black sequencer always defaults to notes and gates active and running. And this is what you get. You can specify what that default note is, if that's helpful to you. So to get notes, you twist. One of 
want to change the gate. Hit gate. Twist. Want to stick modulation in? Twist. I mean, that's it. You know, track written. <laughs> and if you want to change a note, you just you just change it. It throws it up on the screen on whatever it is that you're holding. The clicking corresponds exactly to a semitone. So there's you can feel your way to new notes. You know, you think, oh, that note over there is not right. Don't have to wait until it comes back round. You can just click in the semitone you want to change it by. Other things you can do, you can turn off notes with a bit of a firm press. Don't just sort of tap it. You have to really decide that you're going to do it. If I wanted, I could go into glide mode and shift a little bit of that in. In gate mode, you go up in tens if you want to change that. If you hold shift, you can do a slightly better resolution at one bit at a time. Otherwise, it's all the tens, which is very quick and very easy way to go. If you go to 100, that's going to tie it into the next note. Or you can tie by holding one encoder and pressing the other, and it creates a tie through as many notes as you like. You can also completely disable notes with a double tap. So it's now acting as if those gates aren't even there, so it's reducing the number of notes in the pattern. You can introduce some probability, it's all on 100% to start with. You can bring that down in percentage. Or, if you prefer, you can go down to how many times you'd like it to sound on a revolution on a loop of the pattern. So two times out of three, one times out of two, one out of three, that kind of thing. That way you can put in interesting variations you know, just within the same 16 steps. Ratcheting is exactly what you expect it to be. The alternative you have is repeating under the shift key. You can repeat a note. Up to eight times. This of course is extending your sequence, although it's still within that same 16 steps. If you wanted to do more than one thing at a time, if you hold down the data knob, you can select as many notes between two encoders, and then you can change those together. I could, for instance, show that on some notes. So if I hold the data key, select a bunch of notes, I can move all those up together. If you look at the modulation side, you've got this um, bar graph of modulation where you push things up and down depending on where you want that voltage to go. And that's your basic modulation mode. There are several other modes which we'll get to in a minute. I'm just giving the overview at the moment. So direction and range, these are the things you expect them to be. You can change it to be backwards, forwards, backwards and forwards, ping pong in a couple of different ways, or random. You can move this fella about, so you can increase the length of your pattern. You can change the start and the end and where you want it to be.
which is great all good solid sequencing stuff and you have four channels of that you can do that all over the place and you can do that all day long one awesome feature within it is the magic button now i'm bringing this up now because you need to use it all over the place and it's one of the easiest ways just to get started so if i clear this entire thing i think yeah let's just clear the whole thing i hold magic i'll just stick it onto cv and i've got a new tune hold magic stick it onto gate and it does the gates hold it onto the modulation and we're away <laughs> it's a little rabbit it's a little rabbit in a hat it's fantastic he just gets in there and moves stuff about now you can control that to a degree you can set it up in a range in the magic setup you can set how much cv you want to set it between and uh, on the percentages on the glides on the probability on the ratcheting everything you can specify exactly how much chaos you are happy to introduce with the magic button because the first time i used it it just destroyed everything i mean i assumed uh, that you could sort of undo these things or it would have a pleasant effect on stuff so i'd written a nice little pattern and it was you know chugging away doing its thing and then I hit magic and the whole thing was gone. I mean, it was just nuts. Chaos, completely different from anything I was working on. It wasn't just like a little shift or a little variation. Because it said in the manual, we don't add some interest with the magic button. No, completely screw up your sequence with the magic button is what it meant to say. But once you've controlled it a little bit, it then becomes a lot of fun. <laughs> And you can find all sorts of lovely little things in there. Obviously, if you apply some kind of quantization to the scaling, you can even, you know, you can tailor it in, pull it in a little bit more. If I stick it to major pentatonic, for instance, and then stick that in. That's going to keep things happy. Now, I absolutely assumed that there'd be some kind of undo button. So once I'd injected the chaos of the magic button into my little world, that I'd be able to find my way back out again. No, 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 no. There is no undo. You just have to move forward with it. I mean, what Erica Sint suggests is that you actually save your patterns and then once you've done something, you can then go back to what it was that was saved because nothing is automatically saved. The little flashing record button here is telling you that you've made changes that are not saved. So if you move to another pattern and come back, it'll all be gone. Turn it off, come back, it'll all be gone. So before you use that magic button, I would recommend saving it. Save things just by shift and pressing record, shift record, that's it. And it's saved. So from this point, if I change it, I can then go back by reloading the pattern, yeah? It's magic, like I say, it's magic. See, that's the little performance mode that you have, which you can use just to transpose, just to move uh, tracks about, or you can throw in these um, these rolls, these fills onto uh, all four tracks at once if you wish, allocated to these bottom knobs here. It's a lot of fun. So that, in a nutshell, is the black is the black sequencer. It's really easy. It's easy to create a tune. It's easy to manipulate it. It's easy to throw in interest and variation, and it's just a little bundle of joy to play with and we haven't even got into the real details but there you go simple four channels of that right what more could you possibly want <laughs> well, let's have a wander through that modulation output because they they are interesting 
Very interesting. It can do the modulation thing, as I've already shown you, but it can do an awful lot more. Let me just show you the modes. So you've got, you know, CV, data. That's what we've been using so far. You've then got slide, so rather than having stepped, you have wobbly, wobbly stuff. You've then got CV notes. It can be an entire channel of notes. You've got decay envelopes. You've got ASR envelopes. ADSR envelopes is an ON to the size of these envelopes. Uh, an LFO, it can be it can be a step LFO, per step LFO, and it can be a trigger sequencer. So let's, let's have a look at what all of those do. Let me start with a slightly simpler pattern. So uh, clear the whole thing. Oh, let me do that again. Clear, clear the pattern. Let's give ourselves some notes. So our regular modulation is, as we've seen before, putting up stuff like this. Nice, we've all been there, so <laughs> let's try the next one, which is slide. So it takes the same information, but it just glides up and down through it now. So it's a bit more free a bit more free flowing. That seems fair enough, yeah? Of course, you don't have to be sending this out to a filter cutoff. You can be using it for anything you like. Anything you like. And what gets interesting, or what you start to realise, is that it doesn't actually have to have anything to do with this track. So although at the moment I've got one channel, CV, gate, modulation, all working on the same oscillator voice, don't have to do that. I could have this modulating something completely different somewhere else. Now they are tied together, so the length of the pattern and the mute on and off and things like that are tied together for the gate CV and modulation. But other than that, there's no reason why you have to keep them doing the same thing to each other. Next one. CV note. So in this regard, it's taking the same information and now it's just doing it as notes. So it's essentially sending a sequence to the cutoff of this and changing it in that way. So yeah, all right, but that's that's fine. But let's plug it into another oscillator. And, you know, as I'm here, I can do whatever I want to the notes. Now, what's interesting about the modulation channel when turning it into a note is that it's, it's still unidirectional. So it's taking C0, if you like, as being the midpoint, and it's going negative and positive to that. And because you're changing modulation, you're changing it in chunks of 10, because that's how the Black Sings engine likes to deal with it. And in order to do something more um, refined, you hold the shift key. Yeah, get that. So when we look at it in terms of notes, it's doing exactly the same thing. So I can turn these up, they leap an octave with every turn, unless I hold shift, in which case I can then find the notes in between. So this is of course one channel of the Black Sequencer now running two different tunes. Now the mod output, as I say, works differently because it's essentially designed as a modulation output which they've then sort of wrangled into doing other things. And of course there's no associated gate with this, so you know the STO oscillator here is running all the time, it's not being gated. But there's no reason why I couldn't molt the output of the original gate and add that to it. It just means that they'll retain the same rhythm. Or you can use it without a gate as I am here, so it's just droning through and playing all the time. So the next one is a decay envelope. So we're going to ignore our STO, because we're not going to be using that anymore. We're going to go back to using uh, envelopes with our first voice. 
So this now comes out of here and is going to go back into our our filter for want of use of, of something. So for this, we're now onto our 16 encoders and we can stick in an envelope for whichever one we want and we can extend it between a little bit and to a lot. Now I could use this as being the control over the VCA. Or I could use it as it was back on the filter. Next one is an ASR envelope, which is kind of similar really. Now for the ASR envelope, it feels very much like the decay envelope. But what it actually does is it sustains for the length of the gate and then releases. So if you go back and change the gates, to something else, the uh, the envelope will then follow that. That's probably better understood to go in here. Now the attack is fixed. It's fixed on nothing at all. It's really just a, a sustain release envelope. Okay, moving on to the ADSR. This is different. This is now a uh, an envelope that's operating on every single gate. So rather than being individual per step, this is an envelope for all the time. Uh, for this, the first four knobs have lit up to show you that they are what's in use at the moment so I've got a attack and then decay and then sustain and then release but again it doesn't have to be used on the same track you can use it on something else you know anything else So next one, LFO. Now this is obviously a bit more obvious. So let's jam that back into our friend the filter. And there you go, it's an LFO. Now you can change things. You've got, uh, again, the four knobs here that are controlling stuff. You can turn the sync on. And then it becomes, you know, a, a factor of the tempo. Up to eight times. Ooh, that's quite, quite juicy. And you can change its level so it's not going wanging about quite so much. Let's bring it down to something a bit more calm. Uh, see, that's nice. Change the shape. A bit more triangular. Ramp it in. Or ramp it out. Square it. Sub and hold. Which is always very pleasing. It's lovely just to stick a little bit of a randomization in there. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I love the sound that that gives to a filter. It's just a lovely thing. And then you've also got noise. Not sure what that's for. <laughs> so those waveforms are available on every single modulation output. So the idea being is that you can use it just as a modulation source. 
Step LFO. This is quite funny. <laughs> so for this, each step has its own LFO. Now, I've been trying to work this out. If you go really slow, I guess you can hear it slightly better. But essentially, you're getting one cycle. One cycle of something per step. Trying to work out how exactly useful that is. But you can do, you know, different ones. Triangles, ramps. The square one. And then noise. And it starts getting quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, I played with this a little while ago and stuck a little video up on Instagram. And it had this little loop that was extraordinarily percussive with that noise coming in. It was just brilliant. I don't know if I can. I can't seem to turn them off per step. So to have it just on one step as opposed to all of the steps it seems to be on everything. I mean, if I turn off gates, then, you know, then it won't sound. But can I turn these off? Not with a double tap. I don't have an option to turn, to turn it off. So it seems a little bit in there, I mean, you know, maybe it needs a little bit more investigation, but it looks like you're kind of stuck with a, uh, an LFO per step, whether you want it on there or not. It's kind of all or nothing, all the steps, or, or don't use it, I suppose. And then you get triggers. So for this, I'm going to need something else, I think. So in trigger mode, you've just got your your 4x4 grid. Simple. But if I want to do something else to that, I could take out the mod on the second channel, stick that into, oh, I don't know, say my clap, go to channel 2, go to mod, set that up to trigger. Channel 3, same deal. Then as I forgot to be modulating my, uh, my filter, I'm going to take mod 4, stick that back into my filter. Go to channel 4, go back to modulation. So even though channel 4 is not related to channel 1, particularly, I'm using it to modulate it. So that's all very well. I mean, that's the, the modulation track doing all these interesting different things. But there's things that don't quite quite put it together i mean the, the versatility is fantastic the the things you can do with that mod output is awesome but it's not is not everything that it perhaps could be or should be or maybe down the line because i guess the thing that's most absent from the black sequencer is um drum programming now erica sense of course have an entire drum sequencing computer that you could sit next to this and they would love being together and are ideally placed for being together but many other sequencers hardware sequencers that you know you would see as an alternative to this have like an eight channel drum machine built in eight individual triggers out the back going into different things the black sequencer doesn't have that now the modulation outputs can be turned into trigger sequencers and so they have the ability to run drums just as i've demonstrated but 
all you've got is on and off. You don't have any ratcheting, any probability. You don't have any of the other things that turn drum programming into an interesting place. It's, it's basic, but it's there. And also you are sacrificing modulation tracks in order to do it. So we kind of like <laughs> modulation running into our filter or running into other things in order to go with our melody, our lead or our bass line or whatever it is that we're doing. And so repurposing those modulation outputs is, as I say, awesome, versatile, flexible, but also uh, uh, it sacrifices something else. Is it the detriment of something else? And so while it's awesome that you can still do some drum program from here, and of course you can use the gate outs as well. If you wanted to do drum programming properly, you use the gate outs and then you do have ratcheting, you do have shuffle, you do have uh, probability and all that, all that sort of jazz built in that's not in the trigger sequencing bit, if you understand me. So I love that they've done this. I've loved the versatility. I love that the black sequencer therefore becomes more than just about the tune. It can become about other things too. But it's not it's not fully formed. And so if the the drum side of it is absolutely vital to you, then perhaps this is not the sequencer. Or as what I'm going to do, because I love this sequencer, I'm going to run a little drum machine next to it. So something like the LL8 from Robo that I haven't built yet. I've got that as a DIY kit. It's a little uh, trigger sequencer. I'm going to probably run that alongside something like that. And so, yeah, all I'm saying is if, if drums is your focus, then you're going to need to do that with something else. If you want just a little bit of drums in there, you know, something simple like this, of course, I mean, all of this can be saved as a pattern. So you can go from pattern to pattern and that trigger sequencer will change as you go. But all you've got is your 16 notes or, you know, per bar. You've got your 16 on off notes. That's all the excitement that you're going to get with that. Now, the last thing to look at before we move on to recording is the the buddy to modulation, which is the arpeggiator. Well, it doesn't really have anything to do with each other, but they're on the same button. So that's why I associate them together. If you press shift mod, you're now into per step arpeggiating. And this, this is properly hilarious. <laughs> so I've put my voice back to normal. I've got my modulation out, just modulating the filter a little bit because the arpeggiator acts on the control voltage affecting the pitch, obviously. What the arpeggiator is related to is ratcheting. Because the thing is, you can't hold a chord and stick it into here. You know, you, you can't. <laughs> There's no arpeggiation, it's a mono thing. Each track is monophonic. So instead what Erica Sints have done is added a bunch of notes that follow the ratchet to give you kind of it's more of a trill I'd call it a trill more than an arpeggiation let me see if I can show you what I mean so let's turn up ratcheting in a couple of places like that then let's go to arpeggiation and then what happens is you turn it on and there you go you can have uh, semitones you can have i don't know whatever that is whatever that is essentially different qualities of of chord of notes being put in for you that you can select from just semitones going boop to octaves going boop and you can if you hold shift you can set the ratchet from within the arpeggiator so that you don't have to to mess about quite so much <laughs> but very quickly it turns into something quite bonkers but also delicious if you add in a bit of repeats it gets even more interesting Maybe if I apply that to something else other than an analog oscillator. So I've now stuck it into my surface here, which has got different physical modelled instruments. And that perhaps gives an indication of the value of that arpeggiator section.
I'm starting to get a strum. That's interesting. Right, let's look at inputs and recording. Because this is the, the latest edition in the latest firmware from Erica Synths that enabled the MIDI input, the CV and the gate input. The modulation input is still apparently not quite there yet. The modulation input will let you squirt in control voltage and record freeform, whatever you like. But that's for another time. At the moment, we just want to get some notes in and do some easy sequencing in that regard. Now, while you can do it via CV and gate, I'm going to be using MIDI just because I haven't used any MIDI yet. And MIDI is actually kind of simpler because it is what it is, as opposed to being whatever you want it to be as control voltage is. Now, I'd love to tell you exactly which version of MIDI it is that goes into that MIDI input, type A, type B, that kind of thing. I really don't know. I just kept trying different adapters until I found one that found one that works. Uh, they tell me it's the same as the Arturia one. So if you have an Arturia one, I can't remember where this come from. Oh, this is probably an Ovation one. Then that is what should work. So if we go to the setup, we go to IO here, we can set for each channel, whether it's going to be an analog or a MIDI input and what it is actually doing when it gets there. And so with channel one, which is what I'm plugged into, I've got uh, the input set to MIDI and the function set to fill. And I'm getting a through. So this keyboard here, I'm playing MIDI into the MIDI input and that is controlling both the envelope and the pitch of the oscillator. Okay, with inputs you have a number of possibilities. You have fill. And what that does is it's, it allows your input to override the pattern. Very simple, these notes just replace whatever it is that's going on. But then the, the pattern is still going behind and it fills itself back in once as soon as you release. The next option I've got is add fill. Now add fill um, brings the voltage being generated by your MIDI to CV conversion and adds that to the sequence while you're holding a key. So it's sort of like transposing it, which is what it's doing, while you're holding the note, but that note also opens the gate. And so you have this effect of kind of removing the gate pattern while you're doing it, which is, is slightly odd, I find. But there's another option, which is just called add, and this purely is for transposing. Now, I, I find with this in the relationship between the MIDI and the control voltage is that you need to have your octave all the way down in order to relate to it. Otherwise, because you've got, I guess, values from 1 or, or 0 to 127, if you have your keyboard set somewhere in the middle, you're probably adding on a couple of volts, which is why it's leaping up an octave or two. So, you know, it's just a matter of working out so with these, it, well, you don't have to work anything out. You just have to try these things out and see where it is that it works. But in this mode, it hangs on to that voltage. So it doesn't go back to its original pitches. So I can just do very simple transposition. Another option is through, so you don't have to have it playing at all. So that cancels out the playing back of that channel and just gives you MIDI to CV through that channel. Now I have to go back up octaves again. You 
You can have that set up for each one and you can also set up the modulation output as well. If I go down to the mod one, I should, with a bit of luck, be able to add some of that in as well. So that's adding to the voltage that's already there. If I go for through, that's the same idea. <clears throat> so that is input, but that's not related to the recording function. The recording function is its own thing, and it's it's sometimes often possible to get confused between the two because you turn a thing on and you hit this, and what you're hearing is actually the setup of the input, not the recording, because you're not in record. So <laughs> you find the two mixing with each other unintentionally, but you still have to set up the recording to actually what you want it to be doing. So the last thing we have to look at on the Black Sequencer is its ability to record. This is the thing that came in with the latest firmware update and enables the CV in and the gate in. The mod in, still not working just yet, but that should produce the ability to do recording of control voltage in a very free form and open way. Otherwise, we're still talking about notes on and off and pitch. That's what this is all about. You get to the record options by pressing setup and record. Now I know the record button flashes like all the time, but that flashing is an indication that your pattern is not saved. It's not an indication that you are recording in any way. In the record setup we have a number of options. You can choose between analog and MIDI input. I'm using MIDI here from the keyboard into here. And then you've got various modes. Overdub, so it goes around in a loop and you keep adding notes and adding notes and it replaces what's there. You've got record, which is tricky. You just hit record and you play and it records that in a one in a one shot deal. You've got insert, which is where you hold the knob and press a note and that note gets put into that place. It's like extra slow individual note allocation step record. And then you've got fill, which is proper step record, where you play the notes and the notes get stuck into each step after each step. You have a few other options. You can turn quantization on or off. Now, I mean, a note with that, I talked to, to Gertz Erika since about the quantization side of things and how free form it can become. And essentially he said that whatever you do, it's going to be within a grid because it's a step sequencer. That's the point. You have a step and then you have another step. And that's how these things interact. So it's not going to be fully freeform. However, the resolution you can go down to is, is sense. You can go down to the individual sense within each semitone and also you can go micro time forward and backwards halfway towards the next uh, step, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of room for freeform feel, even if it's still actually within a grid. You can set a gate length for your recordings and also whether you're going through and therefore monitoring the sound as you go and whether you have a little record pop up come up on the screen or not. Those are your settings. Now there's no metronome built in. So there's no real way of knowing how fast anything's going when you're recording your first bit. However, with the pop up on, it gives you a visual flashing indication which you can use as a metronome because it's tied to the BPM. And that's kind of helpful, but I found that it's not as helpful as I thought it would be. So ultimately, when recording, if you're doing live recording, the overdubbing and stuff like that, you just need to wire it into a bit of percussion. So I could wire up uh, the trigger sequencer, have a modulation output and stick that into a, a, a drum source of some kind, or I could just use the clock out, which just occurred to me. So I've put the clock to the thing, and that's gonna give me my metronome. Awesome. So let's go into our first mode for recording, which is overdub. Put that back to CV so I can see what's going on. So I've already got a pattern in there and all I'm going to do is overdub the stuff. So in order to make it happen, I hit record. It's armed and ready to go because it's not playing. It's expecting some kind of input for in order for it to start. I can either hit play or I think I can start playing.
Simple, easy, quantized. Now I could try that with quantization off, but because I'm using MIDI and I'm using a MIDI keyboard, I'm only actually sending note information which is already quantized before it gets there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and in terms of gate length, well, that can be however however long you hold it. You're not going to be changing the quantization of the actual steps because the steps are what they are. You're filling notes into that grid. You can then push those around afterwards with microtiming and with shuffling and all those sorts of things. There's a lot of option in there. But for the recording process itself, it is very much on the money. Well, let's try this record mode. <laughs> Right, record mode. This is going to be fine. It's going to be fine. I'm just going to clear everything and put it armed, ready to go. It's ready to go, so let's do something. See, that wasn't too bad. That wasn't too bad. So with insert, you're inserting a note from the keyboard into one of the 16 steps. Of course, I mean, I'm always talking about 16 steps here because I'm just staying within the first bar. I should just emphasize that there's four bars, 64 steps you can use if you wish, which you can navigate with the bar buttons here. Easy, yeah, simple. I'm just keeping it to 16 just for simplicity at the moment. So I'm going to go back to CV. You need to put it in record in order to do this. And then you hold the note that you want to change and you press the button and it happens. Can you do it while it's running? Let's check that out. Yeah, you can. Pushing down also turns notes on and off, so you have to be a little bit hold it down. In order to make sure that happens rather than just turning the notes on and off. The last one is fill, where it is essentially step recording. So with this, very simply, put it into record and then play. And it's there. So step recording doesn't actually work while the thing is playing back. So if I put it back into record... So yeah, it doesn't capture it while it's playing back. It's purely on step recording mode. So those are your four modes, overdub, uh, record straight in, individual notes, or step record. That's it, but that's kind of all you need. Right, I thought it would be good just to show a little bit of pattern play, how that works, uh, the workflow moving from pattern to pattern, copying and pasting, creating patterns, that kind of thing. Does that sound good? So uh, I'm just going to step record something into a, an empty pattern with a bit of luck. So I created a tune, shift record to save it. Otherwise, I'm going to lose it as soon as I go to another pattern. So I'm then going to copy this, copy, pattern, and then hit the button, because these 16 knobs refer to 16 patterns that you have going at the moment. I'm on pattern five. I selected that to copy. I'm going to go paste, pattern six. So now I've got pattern five, which will play. And then next up, pattern six, which is exactly the same. So let's change something in here in order to make it different. So let's select all of those notes, wind it up to F. So copy pattern six, paste to seven. 
Go to CV, select all that, dial it up a couple more. Make sure I save it. Saving is the one thing I have trouble doing. Back to patterns, so I've now got three patterns. Easy, if I hold shift, I can go directly to another pattern. Rather than waiting for the end of the loop. I can throw together a quick chain of patterns by holding the pattern button and sticking in what I want. So five, six, seven, six, seven, five. And then that'll step through those patterns that I've just specified. So it's very much like the song mode, which I'll come to in a second, but it's just a quick, sort of dirty way of doing it that you could do in the middle of a performance. To put it together in a song, you just select song mode, hit where you want it to save, and then you stick in your chain of patterns. I'm going to stick in five, that's going to go uh, twice I think. There we go, and then six, seven, back to five, back to seven, six, five, etc. And then it follows its way through. And it's very easy to, to navigate along. You can put patterns in between the place where we had a pattern. Let's put a seven in there. Uh, or you can change the one that was there down to a five, up to a seven. I'll stick a five in there or a six or whatever that was. So it's really easy to chain them up and to edit it to create the song of your dreams or whatever it is you're trying to put together. So there you go, there's my whiz around black sequencer what do you think of that how does that make you feel so to try to summarize my feelings about it the, the knob interface is fantastic the feel of the knobs the turnableness of it the clicking of it is great the, the multifunctional ability of it to be all sorts of different things in different places is fine it works well the connection with the display the display always tells you where you are and what's going on whenever you move something it brings it up to the front so that you can see it and appreciate it and acknowledge what it is and then move on to the next thing the you don't feel hampered in any way that you're having to use the knobs for different things it becomes obvious because you know, on an analog sequencer you only ever move the knobs to change the pitch Whereas in this, you do that, and you can do it in all sorts of other places as well. And that makes it very flexible, very versatile within its space. There's a danger, I guess, of being fixated on the screen so that you lose that sense of finding pitches and exploring sequences. You tend to be doing things a bit more deliberately, a bit more intentionally, which is no bad thing. It's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a different thing. So if you're looking for a purely analog experience, then this perhaps is not it. Because what this does really well is meld together that analog feel with the digital versatility of the engine that's inside. At a basic level, you can sequence four channels of stuff, but then you can start messing with it with those modulation possibilities. Lots of them, lots of fun, lots of difference, lots of variation. I found in performance it works really well. You've got these mute and solo options here. Mute or shift it and then solo. They're brilliant. Works really, really well. Uh, plus you've got transposition in there, a little bit of roll. The playfulness of the patterns works really well. You can set up, I mean in a performance I did recently I had four patterns essentially with masses of stuff going on and I was able to very easily just move between them to advance the performance to a, to a next bit, to another change and then drop it all back in. Brilliant! Very easy to feel your way through that without having to create a song or commit to some kind of structure. The layout 
is on that nice edge of being a little bit too fiddly. I mean, lots of stuff is available on a single push, which is great. So I want CV, I can do that. Gate, I can do that. All the main features. But some of the other stuff, we start getting under shift this and shift that and set up this, which, you know, it just becomes, <laughs> becomes a bit of a faff. But not so much that it's, that it's gonna hamper what you're doing. It just becomes a mild inconvenience. The magic button is, is brilliant. I mean, it, it's ultimately just randomization, but it just works really nicely and you feel you can you can just hold it and poke it at different things in order to make a change there's other variations for instance if you hold shift and press on the data on the data wheel you can dial in different sort of gate configurations note patterns if you like which is a lovely feature that i didn't discover until very very recently and there's lots of those little touches with the whole modulation output erica since have have sort of massaged it and worked on it and thought well what else could we do like lfo yeah that's great that's great so, but what else could we do like lfo per step oh yeah that's a bit interesting what else could we do and you can sort of sense the progression in in what they're doing and the fact that they've enabled you to be able to do notes in there to do triggers in there to do other modulations is totally brilliant i mean the very fact that it has envelopes that it can generate saves you a whole load of rack space for other things having to produce envelopes so versatile yeah but also intelligently helpful and something which is going to to fit well within my system i mean that's the other thing it's not huge i mean when you compare it to a beat step pro or a key step or even i've got the korg one under here that i'm still working on you know sure it's taken up a chunk of your of your rack but it's not taken up as much as most sequences do i mean sure it doesn't have a drum engine that's the that's the one thing the one thing and i understand why having spoken to to gertz about it I, I get it. I get it that four channels of melodic sequencing is is really what you want. And there's plenty of other things to do the drum side of it. Because, I mean, for instance, with the Korg, you've only actually got three channels of melodic and one of percussion. So you have actually can only do three tunes. So you've got pros and cons of what that means and what that does and how that affects the amount of space you're going to be using. Um, I love the focus on, on melody. I kind of expected... Uh, the, the sequencer for America since to be all about the noise, all about the glitch, all about, you know, dissonance and uh, because, you know, that darkness is kind of what we love about them. But it's incredibly uh, melodic. It's got loads of good scales in there. It's all about notes. It's all about being musical. Uh, more than making bleeps and noises and grrrs and all that kind of thing that you often find in Eurorack. So it's a great place to play for your bass lines, for your leads and other stuff. I mean, in this performance that I did, I used it, two channels of it, for running these very long drone pads. And then I used some drums out of the mod outputs. I used the bass line and something else, modulation out of another channel. You know, it was running all over the place into all sorts of things. You could very easily see this, you know as the controllable center of your world. And it doesn't have to be complex. You can just hit magic and CV and you've got a line already. You've got something going on. You don't have to sit there and try to program something. Though if you want to, of course you can. <laughs> it just allows you to put together melodies really quickly in order to then start exploring the sounds and how you're going to craft those into that banging piece of techno that you're trying to put together or, you know, wh whatever it is. So shall I finish off by attempting to put a quick tune, quick tune together to see to see whether I can pull that off. And hopefully, you know, I'll try to cut it down to some kind of sensible length so it gives a flavor of working with it, building up a track. Let me try to do that, I think. And otherwise, I hope that was useful. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.